Those are right, okay. Not the it's fine, no. <laughs> so Joseph Addison's The Free Order was a literary periodical. It ran for 55 issues between 1715 and 1716. Each issue of The Free Order was an essay printed on two sides of one sheet. There was no illustrations, no advertisements, no other stories, just one essay. So you, as you can imagine, it lends itself quite well to Pecha which is all a visual-based presentation format. In 1715, there were two political parties, the Whigs and the Tories. And here we've got Dr. Johnson's definitions, slightly biased there. Uh, yes. uh, um, but basically, extremely broadly, the Tories were passionate about parentary right. They thought political power should reside with the elite, the landed gentry. These Country gentlemen through their property had a physical link back to the nation's origin. Here's Downton Abbey. Um, they had always been here, they always would be here. They instinctively knew what was best for the country, it was in their blood as far as they were concerned. And crucially, you either were part of this aristocracy or you weren't. They were conservatives, they wanted to conserve the status quo. So they were deeply skeptical of trade and commerce, largely because trade could make country gentlemen the non elite. <laughs> The Whigs, on the other hand, were committed to a balance between liberty and political order, government by consent, and a mixed and balanced constitution. The Whigs were more interested in trade. They thought, in theory, that any man should be able to make his fortune. They thought Parliament should work in dialogue with the monarch, but were vehemently against any suggestion of absolutism. In 1715, following the death of Queen Anne, the Tory party just collapsed and the Whigs had won a majority in Parliament. The Freeholder is a Whig periodical, probably funded by the Whig ministry. However, it goes out of its way to present itself as being different from other political papers in distribution at the time. As you've already seen, there were plenty of issues to polarise the Whigs and the Tories, and they now had a rapidly expanding print culture in which they could play out their disputes. As a result, there are a lot of antagonistic, aggressive, and virulently polemic things going into print. Um, this is what is sometimes referred to as the rage of party in print, and here's a bit of poetry about that. Uh, pretend his son saw with factious zeal possessed, for wild divisions reigned in every breast, for empty and un unmeaning words begun, and with unthinking fury carried on. The freeholder looks at this war in print and says, no, I'm not going to do that. Um, it contrasts itself with Jonathan Swift's uh, The Examiner, a paper which claims to be presenting the strengths of the Tory party, but as Addison points out, in actual fact, just talks about the weaknesses of the Whig Party. And often these aren't ideological problems or ideas of policy that it focuses on, but personal attacks on Whig Party members. For the freeholder, this is unhelpful and draws the argument away from politics and away from any resolution, because that's what the freeholder claims to want, resolution, reconciliation, peacetime. It claims not to be interested in winning, but in reaching an agreement. It presents itself as a paper being beyond all that. It concedes that both sides have made mistakes and both sides have lots to learn. It imagines itself beside the reader as they weigh up their options together. Um, here's an extremely nice quote about that. But it basically <laughs> says, you know, the Tories have got problems, the Whigs have got problems. Um, if we listen to both of them, we're not going to get anywhere because they're both basically lying. So don't trust them, trust me. Crucially, this means that the freeholder can be read by Whigs and Tories. In fact, I argue that it's designed to be explicitly attractive to a Tory readership. The term freeholder means a person owning an estate worth 40 shillings or more. It signifies property, and the Tories were obsessed with property. Furthermore, less than a year earlier, an arch-Tory figure named Francis Atterbury published a highly controversial tract called Address to the Freeholders of England, which was pretty much a vehement Tory manifesto. It was so controversial that it provoked dozens of printed responses, and the freeholder debate became the talk of the town. By the time Addison's Whiggish periodical appears, the word freeholder was almost synonymous with Tory. And he almost appears to agree with Atterbury. Atterbury suggests that power should reside with the landed gentry because their property physically links them in to the nation. They always act for the nation's best interest because they want to protect their property. Addison says, yes, great, I totally agree. But if you give property to everyone, or at least everyone with 40 shillings, then everyone will be invested in the nation and it will be in all of their best interests. He's saying you can be with and still maintain a land of interest. Rather than disputing Tory ideas, he takes them, makes them Whig, but tries to ensure that they are still attracted to the Tories. But the freeholder does this almost imperceptibly over 50 issues, slowly persuading its readers almost imperceptibly in a very tentative way. He doesn't tell them to become Whig, but he loads the dice just enough to ensure that based on the evidence that he gives them, they'll convert to being Whig almost on their own accord. So in terms of intention, it isn't actually that different from what the other periodicals, like the Examiner, are actually doing. It's still fighting the war on print. The only reconciliation it truly longs for is one resulting in the total conversion of the Tory party. Peace through unanimous Whiggish victory. Where it is different is the way in which it attempts this, and the difference is one of style. Getting ahead of myself now. 
Edison attempts the same task as Swift's examiner to convert the enemy, but he does so without his reader ever realizing the conversion is happening. And that, I believe, is potentially more politically violent than anything Swift was, was doing in the exam, so who cares? Well, Whig revisionists, for what? As already seen in Johnson's dictionary, the Tories were excellent self publicists and in texts like Alexander Pope's Duncia and Johnson's Lives of the English Poets, they successfully, self-consciously wrote most of the writing of the Whig opposition out of the literary canon. The 18th century authors you think of today, Pope, Swift, Gay, are all Tories. The Freeholder represents part of an almost entirely forgotten Whiggish literary culture, uh, which is in need of recovery and revision. It's also a new image of Addison, not necessarily the reconciliation judgment we find in the spectator that people tend to conflate with his own personal identity, but something more violent, something more like John Rambo. Well, <laughs> um, perhaps most significantly, the way in which Addison attempts to bolster the Whig Party faithful, whilst also converting the Tory opposition, by taking an essentially Tory idea, that of the freeholder, and then slightly subverting it to make it almost imperceptibly emblematic of his own cause, that use of style politics, that's something very familiar to us today. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, this is another slide. Here we are. <laughs> so here we've got the Ed Miliband at the Labour conference the other day, uh, taking a Tory idea of the One Nation, invented by Disraeli, a 19th century Tory, uh, which was also used by Tony Blair. He's using reappropriation there. And then David Cameron, and now Ed Miliband. So a Tory idea, that of the One Nation, being used for a Labour cause, is very similar to what the freeholder is doing with this Tory idea of the freeholder. And that's the end. <laughs>